Uh, the name of this panel is Instruments and Regulations <coughs> of GR Lobbying and Advocacy in Latin America. So the focus, of course, is of government relations, as the entire conference is. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's always hard when you get a, a panel on Latin America because you know Latin America goes from you know Doug's specialty, which is Brazil all the way to Honduras and so how do you compare those two things so it's it's one of those it's one of those great um, problems and I'm going to try to do some big brush broad brush uh, painting of uh, a Latin America which is going through a pretty severe moment of political convulsion but like it's always been in Latin America. There's a lot of juxtapositions to that because while it's going through a severe moment of political convulsion, it also had one of its best years in foreign direct investment last year. So th this is pretty typical when you talk about Latin America. There's lots of juxtapositions and opposites that, that happen. But there are certain things that I think are worth mentioning that are sort of first time, you know, Latin America has a long history of boom and busts, but there are some first time things that are happening in Latin America um, which are worth mentioning. First of all, like everywhere else in the world, Latin America is going through a moment of extreme populism, populism that both emerges from the left and populism that emerges from the right. You have uh, the recently elected president in Argentina who is an extreme populist on the right, you have the elected two years ago pres new president, relatively new president of Colombia, uh, Mr. Petro, who is a populist on the left. So it's, it's very difficult to sort of um, uh, put people in boxes, but uh, there is a sense of populism and really trying to um, respond to a sense of anguish uh, that exists throughout the, throughout the hemisphere in voters and an increasing lack of trust in uh, democratic institutions. Second thing which I think is very new is the rise of ethnic politics. This is particularly true in the Andes, but it really is true everywhere. But it's, it, and, it's in, and to categorize it is difficult, but ethnic <coughs> politics with, with uh, indigenous Americans, so indigenous Latin Americans, so you look at Bolivia and Peru, Ecuador, you see a lot of that, but also, uh, also uh, Afro-Latin Americans have an increasing amount of voice and political power. The vice president of Colombia is a uh, Afro-Latin American, uh, very popular, very radical, uh, but, but people trust her because she uh, is very critical of, uh, of institutions. And this is, this is is, is playing a lot of havoc with politics. Third is a, is a uh, increasing degradation in the rule of law. Now that always goes hand in hand with, uh, with, with, uh, with populism, but with that increasing degradation in the rule of law, you see uh, enormous amounts of regulatory encroachment into the private sector. So uh, you see that in a lot of sectors, notably in the extractive industry, in financial institutions, and in healthcare, uh, it began 20 years ago in Venezuela, where it's been made into an art form regulatory encroachment, but it's now quickly spreading to Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and uh, and other countries. Um, and 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 last, I would say there is a new impact. This, and, and I'm basically trying to point out some new new factors. There's a new impact on of immigration and emigration. Like in the United States, like in Europe, you, get, you have a lot of political impact from, from 7 million Venezuelans that have emigrated away from Venezuela, first to other Latin American countries. They were welcomed uh, with open arms, um, unlike many immigrants other places in the world. There was a real sense of trying to, trying to help. Of course, then the pandemic broke out and things got much more difficult economically, and those open arms closed a bit, uh, but uh, emigration and immigration is, is playing a role in really juggling what's happening in the, in the region. So you, you have these political convulsions. These political convulsions have a direct effect on how, how do 
organizations, both private and, and nonprofit organizations, how do they affect, how can you affect government? How do you, how do you lobby? How do you construct a message? In that level of mess, uh, it becomes much more. It becomes much more difficult to do. And all I would say, and I'm going to end here, and happy to answer any questions, is advocacy and government relations in Latin America today is not for the timid. Um, you have to get into fights. You have to expand your horizons far beyond the traditional sense of going to Congress or going to the executive. Uh, um, to executive authorities or regulatory authorities. You have to think about social media and a media strategy. You have to think about how to communicate your message, map your stakeholders, organize your stakeholders, get your stakeholders to speak for you because you'll never be a popular speaker if you're a private institution. So I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a boxing match. And uh, you have to be tough, you have to be careful, because particularly if you're a foreign company in Latin America, you today can be attacked for trying to, uh, you've always been able, you've always been attacked for trying to mess around with domestic politics, but now there are multiple levels of attack on social media in, in the news that make it very difficult to do. So it's definitely not for the timid. I'll stop there. Well, thank you very well said. much. Well said. Well, um, Peter has set up the scenario of what Latin America looks like today and given some highlights on operating in Latin America. So, Doug, what are your thoughts on uh, methodologies, approaches to getting the work of advocacy done, of uh, carrying out government relations given these conditions? That's an excellent question. And actually, uh, it's, um, I've been in Latin America actually since 1979. Started in Mexico as a kid, going down to 16. I uh, got to live native with the uh, local families in Tanapantla and uh, fell in love with the culture, fell in love with the language and uh, learned the language fluently. Um, later actually served as a missionary in Chile during the revolution against Pinochet, was there for two years and uh, built uh, a number of companies in Mexico, in Colombia, Panama, in uh, Chile and in Brazil. And the, the thing that I have noticed, uh, I, I kind of naturally go native. Um, I think the biggest mistake that most countries make is they go foreign, they go to an international market thinking that that's going to be an easy way to make money because maybe competition in their own market is, uh, is too hard. Uh, but then they go into the Latin American market or any other foreign market without understanding the, politi the politics, uh, what motivates the, the local economy, what mo motivates the local uh, businesses, and how those structures occur. Uh, every government is different. And that is a, has a tremendous flux between different parties and different presidencies, but they're also extremely uh, affected and impacted by the larger geopolitical scale of what China is doing, looking for natural resources, for example, or even communism versus uh, democracy versus other uh, republics that exist. One of the best examples is Chile with uh, the, you know, the struggle between Allende and his backing and Pinochet and his backing. And people take every possible side you could imagine, um, not understanding that Chile was actually the stablest economy in Latin America because of the decisions that were made, good or bad, um, based on how it was handled. Um, in Brazil, um, I have started several companies, and uh, I sold one to Enron many years ago. It was actually Fleur Daniel, that was 25 years ago, so it's, uh, it's probably good to keep the bio short because we're way, way too big otherwise. But the experience that I had, I literally started a company in a garage in Sao Paulo uh, with my Brazilian friends. And when I was at Fleur, I learned something very interesting. We went down for the B-band development, and that was the first cellular we walked down and found uh, 1950s plain old telephone Ma Bell Gray dial phones with party lines. And the amazing thing in that economy is understanding the explosive potential on the talent pool just in Brazil. You had Unicamp, you had uh, Instituto Nacional de Telecomunicações in Santa Ita. You had some of the best engineers that I had ever had. Um, in Mexico, I worked in Guadalajara with the Politecnicos and built a tremendous team of over 350 engineers that I deployed all over the world. They were inexpensive, they knew all of the technology, CDMA, TDMA and everything. I was able to train them in everything. I did the exact same thing in Brazil starting uh, incubators um, in different universities because we didn't have enough employment 
accessible. They didn't have a 1099 approach to business. So we couldn't contract bodies, and there were no body shops. We literally created it. We went to the universities. I actually spoke in several symposiums down there, went to their, um, their engineering schools, and I met the students, and I found unbelievable. You think about Brazil, you have Embraer. You know, Taurus isn't a good example because it's a not very good quality weapon, but the, um, the Brazilian economy is full of entrepreneurial zeal uh, with, with really nationalist pride, with uh, really hard flag waving, almost the way you consider the way the U.S. Uh, should be in understanding who we are. They are very nationalistic, very proud of their m multiple cultures that have combined in there to create a very powerful economy. And I think the greatest mistake that countries make and people from different countries make is they don't go native. They spend too much time trying to extra extract revenue from the country instead of building viable partnerships. And lastly, the one that really I found uh, interesting with Fleur, uh, and it was also exemplified in many other companies, they would build partnerships where they would have a 75-25 split in favor of the expatriate company. That's ridiculous. The locals are taking all the risk. The, every bit of the political risk, the economic risk is local. And what ended up happening was the culture that they built by taking a majority and removing that from the country is they created an enmity um, within the companies and people did not support the projects as the way they could. It actually almost creates a black market economy as any corrupt government does. So when you start looking at counter-corruption, you really have to look at how people are motivated in that country and what causes them to do that, because ultimately we're all the same. We're businessmen that want to create revenue. We want to support our families. We want to be happy and go on vacation. If you really strip it down that, you can do business anywhere in the world, and you'll find commonality with all your partners. But the biggest is go native and partner local. Well, thank you very much for those insights. Malka. What do you have to add? You, you, we have an interesting scenario, scenario playing out all across Latin America. We have some advice on going native, going local. Uh, for those who pursue advocacy, are interacting with governments, what is your advice? I would like to retake some of the points that Peter was, was saying. And Mexico is undergoing through a tremendous change. I think that traditionally we're, of course, our president is part of the trends that, that Peter was mentioning is he's a populist president leaning <coughs> towards the left. And the reason he came to power was because there is a huge anger that he knew how to capitalize that anger in a very effective way. So what he has done is foster the polarization of the Mexican electorate. Basically, before I have to say that Mexicans are well, a very, very small segment of Mexicans goes, goes out and votes. So the, in reality, the election where he was elected president, there was a huge flow of people that have never gone out to vote. And I think that it was prior, partly that anger that, that fostered that. But now we see a huge apathy with the electorate on one side that traditionally uh, they don't go out and vote, but we're seeing a revival of this uh, interaction of sectors of the population that usually never went out to, to claim for the rights because President uh, Andres Manuel is trying to basically eliminate all the checks and balances and um, concentrate power. I think that like many other Latin American countries, that is what's happening. And the rule of law certainly is not um, very strong in Mexico. There is a huge disdain of the president of laws, he, he actually nullifies and, and goes out repeatedly to say that uh, he, has, he has a very um, known saying, don't tell me that the law is the law, meaning that you know he, 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 there is not a huge respect for laws in Mexico. And then you go out and you have a president that, that undermines legality, which is terrible. So then that translated to um, how lobbying is carried out in Congress. You have people, you have companies that, of course, have always uh, been lobbying for loss, and it's much more on a debt, debt, uh, debt, debt, debt uh, um, interaction with, uh, with our legislators. And you have also the chambers of commerce that go out and do this lobbying. But now you have, each time, much more segments of the population that, I don't know if you, you, you are familiar with the, the, the pink tide, which are many Mexicans 
that never participated in politics are going out to claim for rights. So now, before there was the links between our representatives and us as citizens were virtually non-existent. It's not like in the States that we can go and call our representatives. It's, it was not done before. So now civil society is engaging and actually that link between the representative and the representatives is starting to grow a little bit more. Um, I think that there is a huge, uh, there is, a, there is also, like Peter Schechter was saying, there is a problem that is invisible for the moment in Mexico, and that's immigration. All immigration that is not being able to go through to the United States is staying in Mexico, and that is changing and will change enormously our politics and our environment and social environment. You have people from Haiti, you have people from Venezuela, from Nicaragua, from Honduras that rather than going through to the United States are staying in Mexico. And it is rumored and with huge evidence that our current party, Morena, is trying to give them rights and trying to give them citizenship to be able to have uh, more votes and consolidate themselves in power. And then there is another thing which is interesting that I think that it's another, it's virtually non-existent in the media. China and Russia are investing heavily in Mexico and sponsoring a lot of, of the party in power. Um, they're giving funds to the party in power. And that is something that has been invisible for Washington, but I think that is something that should be of a huge concern for, for Washington. And I think that those are things that, um, in a way, the, the party has also, uh, those are things that will be changing our politics. And for instance, in, in when the invasion of Ukraine, the president never went out to criticize Russia as a country. It, um, many, many legislators um, received um, ro a Russian committee in, in the Senate. And I think that that is something that we were traditional allies about. Uh, we have treaties together, and that is something that politics is shifting, and I think that Washington should pay a lot of attention on that. And my last point is that um, I think that companies companies are having, of course, Mexico with nearshoring has been very attractive for a long time, and nearshoring will certainly be, be a factor. The problem is that security has been degraded in these last times. Uh, the president changed, we had a federal force that was relatively effective, and now with the National Guard, it's been hugely ineffective, and companies routinely complain about security, routinely complain about the rule of law, and I think that Mexican government should think on both issues and act upon it, because nearshoring is not, as many people here in Mexico and many companies think, is not a natural thing. The conditions have to be right, to be able to foster and be able to exploit it to its maximum potential uh, near showing. So basically those are some of the points that I wanted to put forth. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I open up the floor to questions, I will take my prerogative as moderator to ask the first question. Uh, the question that I have is, it involves the globalization of Latin America. Since the declaration of the Monroe Doctrine in 1823, the United States has laid claim to Latin America as its exclusive territory. But as we've all seen in the latter part of the 20th century, in particular in the 21st century, other countries from around the world have been encroaching on the, USS, the United States' claim to uh, primacy in Latin America. As Malka pointed out, China and Russia are inv investing in Mexico uh, as an experience that I've, I've witnessed in the 25 years that I lived in Turkey. Uh, it wasn't until 2014 that the first organization in Turkey made a formal agreement with a country in Latin America, Ecuador, and that organization, by the way, was our global organization. We were the first Turkish organization to sign a formal agreement with the country of Ecuador, even before they established diplomatic relations. Um, since 2014, we've seen a number of um, embassies, we've seen a number of consular offices opening throughout Latin America, we've seen honorary consuls 
open up in Turkey. There are other countries like Egypt, um, Saudi Arabia that are now moving into Latin America. Given the current <coughs> turmoil that we see throughout Latin America, given the uh, decades, if not centuries, of primacy of the United States, for other countries who aren't China or aren't Russia, if they want to improve business, uh, improve relations with Latin America, what approach should they take? Uh, it, it's a great question, and, and look, I think I think the uh, what's happening in Latin America in terms of the diffusion of U.S. the, the, the diffusion of power around the world and the and the sort of ebbing of United of U.S. primacy and certainly the ebbing away of bipolarism uh, has allowed countries all over the world, whether in Africa or South Asia or in Latin America, to become what's some people lovingly call fence sitters, and so you don't have to commit to either side. I mean, China has become the largest trading partner of Latin, of Latin America today. I mean, so it, it used to be unequivocally the United States, and it has become the largest, uh, China is now the largest trade, trading partner. But that opens uh, space, certainly for many other actors, and you mentioned, you mentioned a couple, certainly Gulf countries, I mean, Latin America remains an enormously attractive, resource-rich place to do business, which is why China does so much business uh, there. Um, uh, so I, I think there's there's lots of room to expand uh, to expand uh, your interests in in Latin America. But I would say one more thing: it's not only countries. It is non-state actors that are also uh, growing in importance in Latin America, and <coughs> after some considerable ebbing of organized crime, I mean, Latin America is right now going through a really deplorable rise in organized crime, influencing every aspect of, uh, of, uh, of decision-making. So what, what, what Malka was talking about, uh, in terms of uh, security degradation in Mexico, which is a feeling also of voters not being able to go on the street, but it's also about uh, certain decisions to bring the police and army back into the barracks and not no longer attempt to quote unquote reduce violence by stopping the fight against organized criminal activity. That that has been AMLO's uh, uh, patented way to move forward. He's now exported those, uh, that intellectual property to Colombia. Co uh, President Petro has also sort of massively reduced uh, the engagement uh, against uh, uh, organized crime. And so you have this explosion of uh, organized crime that is, that is also another reason why you have this large, large shift in the political balance uh, and what I call convulsion in Latin America. Let me just say one last thing. I mean, I, I don't want to forget this juxtaposition that I pointed to at the beginning of, when I, when, of, of my, of my uh, comments, which is, you know, Latin America continu continues to be relatively a young population, a middle class population, uh, incredibly resource ri rich, water rich in a, in, a, in a world where water is, uh, is disappearing, an agricultural juggernaut, um, a bubbling civil society. So, you know, there's a, also a reason why foreign direct investors decide that it's, it's, a good place to, it's a good place to invest, notwithstanding the security problems, notwithstanding the political convulsions, notwithstanding the, the, the uh, regulatory encroachment. So you, you do have this thing that you've always had in Latin America, which is there's, there's a lot of steps going backwards, but there's some steps going forward as well. Okay. Right. okay. Thank right. you so aside from going, going native, going local, what, what can companies do? Well, it, it's, it's interesting because um, I was actually in the process of advising on uh, secure communications for President Bolsonaro when the election went the opposite way. Um, I was doing the same thing in Ukraine where Russia uh, actually changed the focus from intelligence and technology and communications over to bullets and uh, 155 artillery rounds. Um, so the, we should just find out where you're going. And yeah, you're don't, don't go where I go. It just, it, it just it don't follow me. There's going to be an earthquake or a civil war, and I did not do either. 
Uh, and in, in you, when you talk about Monroe Doctrine, you're talking about the uh, the kind of general traditional U.S. big big brother for the Americas. Uh, one of the most important things is, uh, from the military perspective, the defense collaboration, which was the UNITAS program, which is kind of a, all, all of our sailors, all the navies get together and they come out. Many of the other navies outside of Latin America have started to participate in that, which also recognizes the trade. The recent uh, BRIC program, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, that is a huge indicator of a much more global market. Brazil is producing wheat, uh, sugar, about everything beef you can imagine being exported into Africa, to China, to Dubai, you know, to UAE, Saudi Arabia. Halal chicken has been produced and sent all through the Middle East and uh, in Africa to Muslim countries. Um, same thing with going into uh, kosher for Israel and, uh, and Jews all over, diaspora Jews all over Latin America, which there are many in, in Brazil specifically. Um, the other one is trade. When you're looking at Brazil as a market, for example, because it is truly global, Brazil has trade agreements across Mercosul, Mercosul, which is your South American and Central American, but they also have trade agreements with Africa. Uh, because of the Portuguese roots and the slave roots, Brazil is probably the most fully integrated multiracial from, from Latino to mulatto to everything else you could imagine. And many dialects are spoken, not just Portuguese, but multiple dialects of Portuguese and native dialects in the country. Um, so you're looking at trade with Europe, which would actually be Portugal and, uh, and Cape Verde, and with Africa, Cape Verde trade, and all those, that all exists. So if you're looking at working in Latin America and you're looking at working ethically and protecting yourself against significant economic shifts, it still comes down to go local and go native. Structure your partnerships, public pri par private partnerships work. They are, well, there's excellent organizations, American Chamber of Commerce, our embassies, our commerce, their embassies here. Uh, all of the African embassies that I've worked with here and the uh, Latin American embassies here are excellent. And so uh, the security partnerships, probably our biggest problem is trafficking. And uh, I've been doing that for 38 years, counter human trafficking, counter drug trafficking, piracy. I worked with a program with the health ministry and uh, <coughs> First Lady Bolsonaro on Marajo, which has probably the largest undocumented, uh, completely disenfranchised population in the world that are being harvested like cattle and sold off to body parts and uh, child sexual trade. And that's going right up the Amazon. So these are real things that are happening. That's come up into the U.S., which is one of the biggest consumers. Europe is one of the biggest consumers. And uh, this is something that is now becoming more real, and people are realizing that ugly part of what's going on is inhibiting trade and getting in the way of real commercial relationships, and it's also inhibiting and affecting the, uh, the political stability in the countries because some political aspects are tied directly to that trade in, in, in uh, illicit business. All right. Thank you very much. Malka, what do you think? Non-traditional partners for Latin American countries, what can they do to advocate for their positions, their businesses, their citizens? I would like to, to, to retake, I spoke about all the negatives of Mexico, but I think that there are many potentials. Like, of course, there is a problem with security. Of course, there are many issues that need to be corrected. But first of all, I have to say that the Mexican population is incredibly diverse. The population that we find in the North has nothing to do with the one in the South. Yet, you have a, a huge pool of very creative players here in Mexico that many nations have found a very uh, fertile ground to develop their, their products, to develop their services. They're very hardworking people and very joyful and very resilient in a way. When I was working for the Ministry of Finance in Mexico City, many companies used to come and I connected them with the UNAM, which is one of the most important universities in, in, in Mexico City. And it, is, it was an incredible experience because through the UNAM, they were, they were able to develop their products and um, be tried um, their products in a very safe environment because it's so diverse. It's a city within the city. So you had unguided cars that were tried in Mexico. I mean, believe me, if you can uh, pass all the hurdles of, of a car that is not right, driven by persons here in Mexico City is that you are doing great because it's such a difficult environment. So, and I think that also Mexico is in a very, contrary to many uh, other Latin American countries, Mexico has free trade agreements with Europe, with Asia, so it's a very fertile environment to be able to export your products. And as for the United States, we have been um, interacting with the U.S. for so long that 
I think that Mexicans find it easier uh, to interact and do business with the U.S. because so much is uh, oriented towards understanding the U.S. And now that the Chinese are coming because because of the disengagement of the U.S. with China, they are coming to Mexico and trying to use Mexico as a platform to be able to reaccess the United States in a different way. So, in the partition of players, you can you can also um, it's been difficult to interact with them, but it has been also a learning experience and that has strengthened Mexico as an incredible place to invest. And despite the problems, I think that many companies have thrived here. You may, it may come as a surprise to you that um, in order to develop the brand of, of um, London with all the red um, telephone cabins and, and, um, and um, many of their marketing, they came to Mexico to be able to see and get creative ideas out to market the UK. And that has been done with many other brands because here we have really creative people. You just have to see the artisan and you have to see many other services. We come up in our day-to-day, -day, we're so accustomed to have to solve un unimaginable problems that we have become very creative as how to sort out those, those, those hurdles. So I think that yes, despite all the problems that we have and despite this streak of, of populism that has not been very friendly, it has evolved, but from the outset it wasn't very friendly to the private sector. I think that in the practice, after the sixth year already of President Zambo, we have seen that it hasn't been that hostile. It has been hostile in word, not so much in action. So I think that Mexico, maybe in Latin America, it isn't such a bad option for many, and I think that we can see that in many companies still settling in Mexico. Well, thank you. Um, do we have time to open? We're out of time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to thank the. If, you, if, you have questions. if there's a quick question from the audience, no. Looks like everyone wants to keep with your schedule. I have one question. Yeah. So, uh, what, what country in Latin America you think that like modern law will be like classical modern law in the next five years? Cl classical. No, I mean some regulation which will be a more looks like European lobbying law or like American lobbying law. So register regulation, you know, the growing of associations. Probably so Brazil. Brazil. Brazil is, is by far the most advanced country in terms of r regulating how to approach government. It also has one of the most advanced regulatory uh, capacities and it, it enforces that capacity and I think Brazil is, is eons ahead of it anywhere else in the region at sort of having created a, a, uh, a sort of guidelines for how to approach government, whether regulatory or Congress or the executive, uh, with, with, without a doubt. Absolutely. I, I, Brazil definitely for exactly those reasons. Many of the ordinances and laws actually were taken straight out of the U.S. and European. So there are many of those there. Um, I actually wrote the uh, the zoning ordinances for their telecommunication uh, tower siting and radio siting, and um, it was very very easy to work with local governments in the state of Rio and Sao Paulo and the many times I've been up in Brasilia. Um, keep an eye out for Paraguay, uh, Pena. As I was down there for the inauguration and oversight on secure communications for them, there is a lot going on there and some excellent intent. Very very. Uh, We'll call big big plans for that market, and it's a, it's a good place to invest stabilization-wise. The ports that they have in the Rio, uh, in the river between Brazil and uh, and Uruguay are are excellent, and there's plenty of natural resources and opportunity. They just they have some border issues that they need to work on, and they're doing the counter corruption now. Malka, your thoughts? Yeah, I think that Brazil we have a lot of experiences to learn from Brazil. They have been very advanced, and they've learned very well how to um, not only set up regulations in terms of um, being attractive for Europe and for, for the US. I think that it's, we have a lot to learn. I think that in terms of legislation, we have very advanced legislation. The application of that legislation is where we have some trouble with it. It's not so much if, if a US law would come to Mexico and see our legislation, you would find that it's incredibly advanced. But the problem is how the things are applied and how I mean, the respect for laws and for processes that there is a lot of progress. A lot to be done. I think that uh, we've been advancing and the NAFTA agreement, the UNISTA agreement has been 
pivotal in, in, in shaping a lot of our policies in terms of commerce, but there is certainly much to be done. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you to the panelists for your contributions, thank your you. thoughts, your comments. Thank you to the audience for your attention. And I guess we'll sign off for this panel and give the floor to the next panel. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.